Welcome. We are now live, and this is the second episode of Scott and Dan's High Ontology, where we're focusing on Bruno and the Ascent to Man. So, <clears throat> welcome, Scott. Uh, Thank you. We're, yeah, we're in for an exciting new episode. Um, I want to let anybody that's tuning into this uh, know that we do have a post conversation available. And especially for those people from Meetup that are watching, uh, there is a link in the description. So please, after the end of this presentation of this video, join us for a discussion. So um, in that case, um, yeah, Scott, what, uh, what are we, do you want to jump right into it in a clip or do we want to have a little bit of a, a well, prelude? Just, on that? So, you know, all great philosophers have a completion compulsion and Bruno is no exception. So in the last episode, he took us back to the transition period between Australopithecus, not quite human and homo homo, which is human. So that was a, what? 2 million year period. So that's the scale of biological change. And then there's a, an explosion. And uh, in 12,000 years, we go from, homo homo to six o'clock this morning with our bad faith and our alarm clocks. So uh, the curve looks like this. It's a, there's a radical break. So this is the first episode where we talk about the cultural stratum. The biological stratum is done. So uh, for, from, for, for two million years, we tr transitioned from a little ape buddy to uh, what we are today. And then in 12,000 years, we, uh, we transitioned to the high technology. And the beautiful quote that uh, uh, Jacob uses is artists and scientists, city builders and planners for the future, readers and travelers, eager explorers of natural fact and human emotion, immensely richer in experience and bolder in imagination than any of our ancestors. So uh, that's the explosion that this episode covers. And it really focuses on the um, agricultural revolution, which he calls a biological revolution because we weren't taming land. We were actually taming the, the soil, the plants and the animals that are on it. Right, right, right. Well, that's really what I think we should jump into that first clip because that that was that was my first uh, highlight. I think was the was was the biological revolution, which um, he he is. It's a revision for him. He 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 starts off calling it a uh, the agricultural revolution, and then he gets into uh, he likes to label it a biological evolution. All right, here's that re clip. revolution. Sorry, revolution. Here we go. And man who had come through these incredible hardships and marched up from Africa over the last million years had battled through three ice ages suddenly found ground flowering and the animals surrounding him and moved into a different kind of life. It's usually called the agricultural revolution. But I think of it as something much wider the biological revolution. There was intertwined in it the cultivation of plants and the domestication of animals in a kind of leapfrog. And under this ran the crucial realization that man dominates his environment in its most important aspect, not physically, but at the level of living things, plants, and animals. With that, there comes an equally powerful social revolution. Because now it became possible, more than that, it became necessary for man to settle. And this creature that had roamed and marched for a million years had to make the crucial decision whether he would cease to be a nomad and become a villager. Yeah, so I, I purposely stopped it on villager because of the choice, and and to me that signified uh, the 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 point of civilization, right? And um, uh, I thought that was a really interesting transition to his into his his next. Point. It really made made that 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 point as a summary. Now, um, 
I thought it was really worthwhile to to pause and actually think about how he's actually setting this up and framing it. So in the opening credits to the episode, uh, and not only the episode, but also the book, um, it's uh, A Personal View by Jacob Bronowski. And um, I'm just wanting to pause on that and think about that for a minute as to you know, why the producers wanted to do it that way. Um, you, you're talking about a man of science, um, uh, a, a philosopher. I think, Scott, you would agree with that. But the fellow, um, at least with Jacob, the, the realization is that he's outwardly admitting that this is an opinion. Okay, this is an opinion. Um, and so I did bring up a, a quote that I wanted to, you know, bring into the conversation that that hopefully enriches this concept of opinion. And um, it's actually from Timaeus, obviously the, 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 one of the dialogues from Plato. And so I want to share it with you guys and I want to read it to you and then. Uh, and then we can talk about it. So it may not be entirely easy for you to see, but it says, it's this highlighted section that says, what is that which is and has no becoming? And what is that which becomes but never is? The former is grasped by understanding, which involves a reasoned account. It is unchanging. The latter is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception. It comes to be and passes away, but never really is. Now, the reason why I picked this is because I wanted to spend some time thinking about the concept of opinion. And... Um, I wanted to provide some value to what a Bernowski opinion actually means. Um, now, I'm not saying that he embraces this kind of a definition. Uh, heck, I don't even think he had in mind anything to do with Timaeus or, or Socrates or any, anything of the sort. But the production was made in such a way as to openly acknowledge that this is an opinion. And... I think that in society, we almost use this in a dismissive type of way, right? Oh, well, that's your opinion, okay? Um, and, and, and I don't think that's uh, necessarily a, a fair claim on knowledge. And we would say, well, is this truly a knowledge claim if it's, a, if it's an opinion? Now, since the substrate of what our conversation is about, and it's about, it's about culture, I would say it absolutely does. Uh, it is relevant. An opinion is relevant. Now, we say, well, how so is a, an opinion relevant? I'll say, well, an opinion is relevant depending on um, how it replicates. Um, the relational database in which it propagates. And in this particular case, we have an intellectual thought leader um, like Bruno. Um, who has um, a very elaborate and intricate um, uh, form of opinion of humanity. That's what this series is about. Now, isolating his one particular point of taking a concept like the agricultural revolution, which is ubiquitous in, the, um, in our educational systems, and he's saying he prefers to look at it as wider, Right? He, likes to, he wants to look at it and frame it in terms of a biological revolution. So there's, there's a difference because he's including more into that type of thing. And when he includes more, when he, when he includes more, then this is a matter of opinion. This is his view. Now, from my standpoint, I would tend to agree. I see more value in that type of judgment. Okay? Uh, judgment, I was, you know, thinking about, um, and, and Scott, you're really the expert on this, on judgment, but essential, non-essential, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, thinking. And I think in terms of what at stake culturally, I'm thinking there's more value in this to include 
Bruno's definition. So it's like, you know, bring on Bruno's definition. Let's make sure we frame this this way, replicate it in a way that 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 our culture uh, accepts that framing uh, in, in, in a ubiquitous way or as in a, re- a replacement for the simple term of uh, agricultural revolution. And so um, going back to the quote from uh, Timaeus, I was really just trying to to show that that uh, the now first of all, I have to kind of set the stage with what was going on with that point in the dialogue. So this is the early point in the dialogue where where Timaeus is getting really excited. He's talking is he you know in some aspects he's really kind of setting the groundwork for his argument or Plato is with the characters. Okay, and so what happens is that he's um, you know getting really excited and then. Plato responds to not just that section, but a bunch, bunch more. And he says, he goes, um, you know, congratulations, Timaeus. That sounds great. Okay, keep going. Applause sort of thing. And it's a, a little uncharacteristic of, of Socrates to take that sort of an approach, right? And so um, my, my feeling here is that, you know, Plato's kind of like, you've nailed this, son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let me interject. I, I think that it's a trick for BBC to use opinion here in, in a day where uh, presidents uh, say this is 100 percent certain and they're absolutely lying. To hear the word opinion today, it seems like it's a disqualifier. But I think it's just the fact that the British are more polite than Americans. So even if they were presenting arithmetic, just the basics, they might even include a personal view at the bottom because they might be including a historical dimension. So, yeah, n- nothing in here is, is opinion. It's just the fact that every historian has to uh, put things together and synthesize them and to, and to, unless you're just with your hand over your mouth holding up b- bits of pottery and pointing to them and then and then pointing at a carbon dating slab, you're going to be adding some personal unifying views. So I think I think the only opinion here is the fact that he's putting things in a sequence and then there's the really sketchy part, which is the story of progression. Why do we move from stage A to stage B? That's going to be have to have to be conjecture. So I think in, in today's age, when when you know p- politicians lie to your face and, and with with gritted teeth, and I'd say they're actually certain to hear opinions like, "Oh my God, it's it's even beneath political um, certainty." But I, but I really I think the British are just, are just nice. They're nicer people, hmm. and, I, and I think that they would. And, and guys, there's there's very little opinion in here, but they throw that in there anyway, just because there's going to be one narrator, and he's going to be. Well, I guess there's, there's multiple levels, aren't there? Because he has to choose which things to talk about. Even the act of choosing to discuss something throws your personality into the product. So there's just no getting away from the from the agent, from the storytelling agent. So I, I think he's just being self-conscious and, and, and polite and saying, yes, you know, I'm choosing the topics. And I might even add the really iffy part, which is why did we go from this age to this age? What were the influencing factors? Because that's the really that's the, that's why history isn't a science because because you're 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 postulating motivation motivating forces and also primary versus secondary. I mean, who knows the real reasons why something happens? But we have these records here about the, the king said this. So don't you see you with the political motivation? But we don't, we don't know what kind, kind of other things were happening. Anyway, I, I didn't want to get too uh, too far afield on on the opinion thing. But I think yeah, in today's age, opinion seems like a like the, the scariest possible thing to put on an educational product. I guess the only point I think, yeah, we should really move on. But the only thing that I, I was trying to and actually embrace it and look at it from an opposite side of the pejorative and really think of something that was, you know, wasn't so culturally abrasive and say, you know, what's wrong with the opinion, especially when it comes from such a brilliant mind like uh, Mr. Bernowski and, and, you know, kind of taking taking it for a test drive. You know what I mean? <laughs> So okay, all right. So what what's the next one? Are we are we are we jumping into uh, a Scott clip or a Dan clip? Uh, I'm, my, my clip is the next one, but okay. uh, I, I thought it was nice that he called a biological revolution because because what what is the the creature depends on in this case f- food f- food's the important thing. So all all the animal has to manage, like the ant managing his herd of aphids, is his food supply. So this is the story of food supply. First, we chase things around, then we domesticate them, and we still chase them around. And, and we're going to see that later on in the video. Before you you get the animal to really sit home, you if it's eating grasslands, and the grasslands are eaten up every 24 hours, they have to move. So now the human is following the animal. So we're still subservient to it in a way, 
But there's a difference. Like Bernowski says, we can leave that relationship, but those sheep can't. Those sheep are dependent on us. And even later on, we find out that wheat is dependent on humans. And the wheat thinks that God made humans for it because this is a new type of wheat, the one that we eat today. This is a new type of wheat where the, the seeds can't get carried by the wind. So it depends on primates using it for their selfish needs and, and depositing the, 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 the seeds around. So yeah, I, 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 I just pictured the, the human as, a, as an animal that's playing in the topsoil where things are arising and decaying and it's, it's raising animals and raising plants into sucking on them. So, so it's, it's, it's kind of like a controlled long-term vampirism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a forced symbiotic relationship one way, I guess. You know, the, the, the domesticated dog is the same way. There's no way it's, it's now, you know, lost its ability to, you know, survive on its own. Uh, you know, without, 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 uh, you know, being, being yeah. next to, to humans. Right. So yeah, that's very interesting. So, so, so this, this next clip, this next clip is for all the hippies who really romanticize the simple life and would like to go out and read Thoreau in the woods and just to remind them that there'd be no Thoreau if there wasn't a surplus so that humans could think. So, Cause if you're really on the move and you're really busy all the time, then sad things happen with respect to creativity and accumulating cultural knowledge. Okay, ready for the next clip? Yeah. The simplicity is not romantic. It's a matter of survival. When the women spin wool with their simple ancient devices, it's for immediate use to make the repairs that are essential on the journey and no more. The bacterial life is too narrow to have time or skill for specialization. If they need metal pots, they barter them from settled people. A nail, a stirrup, a toy, or a child's bell is something that is got from outside the tribe. There is no room for innovation because there is not time between evening and morning to develop a new device or a new thought. Not even a new tune. Hmm. They don't, don't even make surplus string. They only make them, they, they'll, they'll get the sheep, take the wool, uh, put it together so it's, it's overlapping and then and then only to make repairs. It's, it's an as needed. So they've got a really, they have a really good supply chain. Their supply chain is zero. They wait till something breaks, they fix it, and then by that time it's nightfall. So, so there's, there's no chance to do anything. And you heard that song that he was playing? He's still, according to legend, he's playing the same song today. The tune hasn't changed. I thought, I thought that was a really sad ending. And, and even, look, even look at the mortar and pestle. You know, it's, it really helps. You, you can make a lot better bread if you have a mortar and pestle, but these guys don't have those. You know why? They weigh too much. Mm. And, and, yeah. and look, at the, look, at the, look at the beginning of Judaism, which is the... the the, the great extant monotheistic religion. Why is there one God in Judaism? Why did Abraham only, only have one God? Because they it's weighed 40 mean. pounds. Gods weighed 40 pounds back then. <laughs> well, no, yes. and, and, and so it was, it, was, it was normal for nomads to only carry one. So of course, Abraham is the father of monotheism. They weighed 40 pounds. So, this, so you have to consider that machines weigh and that uh, time is finite and they're, and they're following these animals around. So it's really not that paradise that these incel, like men's club, retro Iron John, uh, feel good self-help groups like to make it sound sound like. Yeah, I hear you, I hear you. All I'm right, just... now here's, uh, uh, yep. Um, okay, so what I was, I did want to bring up the idea of de, uh, Diogenes, right? The, the, the cynic and the, the dog philosopher that we refer to in, in uh, Socratic times. So um, I think that as the story goes, uh, you know, I mean, he, he wanted the, the simplest life and um, he, he basically lived in, a, a, you know, in a container out, you know, out in the street. 
And uh, he just had his little water cup until he saw a kid drinking out of his hands like this, and he threw the water cup away. <laughs> so, so I mean, That's you know, right. following this line of thinking, though, Scott, it's it's like, um, okay, I really think this is worth exploring about the fact that what we cherish so much in terms of art and in terms of beauty and culture, all of these things are um, extra. They're, they're a privilege that happens with surplus and surplus that, uh, that surplus manifests itself with free time. And so, right. yeah, and the simplicity movement is something that only a surplus society could have only in a great surplus society. Could you have the desktop publishing machines and equipment and ink and all this stuff for these women to get together and make these companies like simplicity magazine. It's like an Oprah magazine. That's not simple. I mean, that magazine took a whole team of people and they're cutting down trees to make a simplicity magazine and teaching us how to buy these Lululemons are made out of organic fiber. And you have these women, third world women with tears in their eyes because there's a well next to their village now because Whole Foods built the well. All this is just, it's all marketing stuff. Yeah, no, no one likes it. I mean, we, we fantasize about simplicity and, and being simple, but this is something that we're reading out of a women's magazine at the grocery store. Mm, okay, all right. Um, so... What I, I wanted to actually bring up next is that the uh, let, let's imagine the I know it's a little bit off topic. We're, we're, we're moving off on a little bit of a tangent here, but, you know, heck, why not? So so let's look at the average uh, or a worker, a lower class worker, somebody that's, stu uh, you know, struggling to try and make ends meet. You know, you've got you've heard the stories, right? The double, triple shifts. There's a couple kids. They just absolutely don't even have time to do uh anything i mean I, you know so that enrichment of culture of creativity of being able to develop and explore yourself whatever that means that just doesn't that there's not an option for people of a certain socioeconomic class and um you, you know it really separates uh it's another form of separation between haves and have nots is that would you would you agree with that and well, I, I think it's it's engineered i mean if people if people are worn down and tired, they're likely um, to be a docile and um, they're likely to, you know, watch Fox News and just take advertising and, and, and treat it as if it's reporting. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I think if, if you were running a society and you and you're and you were you didn't have to work because you had people working for you and you made money off of the surplus value that, that they that they were working, it would be in your interest to create people that were working hard being paid little, taking Prozac, maybe playing video games when they go home. They have to do something to, to let off steam. But what you don't want them doing is becoming educated, organizing, and then letting off steam in a way that's going to change their circumstances, right? You don't want them asking for wage increases or medical care or education for their kids. You want them to buy more leggings or something like that. that that's a bad <laughs> example. Or maybe a home exercise kit, something. But, but yeah. more video games and more drugs. I mean, this is the dream of capital. I mean, if I was running a, a game where I had uh, kind of zombie-like humans and I and they're zombie them, help me avoid, I don't know, a revolution or, or conflict or something like that, I think I would, I, would, I would want to keep them just at the edge of exhaustion. I mean, it would just be smart because that, that way they would, they would pacify themselves. Well, not only the point of exhaustion, one of the ways I've been able to frame it, and um, I don't have quite the framing you do, but one of the ways I've been able to frame it is that um, motivation, you've heard this, this, uh, you know, this terminology, you say, well, how am I going to motivate somebody? I can't just give them money for free or, you know, these kinds of things. We talked about right, social right. engineering. And I, and I, this is what, this, 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 this is abrasive to my ears. And the reason why it is, is because we live, we, 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 do we really live in a society where motivation, the, the, the motivator, the big motivator is hunger? I mean, really? Like I have to go to work. I have to, I have to produce because otherwise, you know, like I've got as much savings to maybe get me to the end of the month and that's it. And then I'm, I'm, I'm starving, right? That's the motivation. I don't know. Like, I mean, we, you know, we talk about, and this is, you know, this is something that comes up in, in, you know, philosophy conversations. What is progress? Well, for the average person, I mean, how far out are they in terms of, you know, surplus security? A week? I don't know. At days? Who knows? That's right. right. It's yeah. There's 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 myths myths that we're we're all humans naturally want to be welfare moms, eat Doritos, and sit around the house all day long. That's not actually true. 
if you have a shitty life and things are alienating and boring, you probably want to escape into, into nicotine and, and and television or something like that. I could, I could see that happening. But actually, humans, if if they're in an environment where they're where they were raised as normal animals, they'll explore and look around the house. I mean, rodents do that. In fact, that's how you that's how you tell what, whether th drugs are increasing their intelligence is the number of times they pop their heads up through holes and, and look around. So humans are constantly getting out of the bed and doing stuff. So the, the t tales of human these these are the myths that, that the right uses to, to keep us locked down. Humans are naturally aggressive. You don't if you don't police them, they'll kill each other. They'll be at each other's throats naturally. All right, humans are welfare moms naturally. If you don't scare them with starvation, they'll just sit around the house and not do anything. So there's there's a little metaphysics going on in in these background stories that help justify the way that we engineer human treatment in America. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess the, in the biblical sense and then the the concept of the word, well, I'm just going to say like, you know, I don't know what this preoccupation with jobs is like what, you know, you hear in, in, in the politics, you hear with politicians saying we need more jobs, we need more. Like, I just I, I don't yeah. I don't quite get that. But anyways, according to the Wall Street Journal, we need to, we need to do four hours a week. Of, of, of average social, socially average uh, labor to, to reproduce the curtain level that we're at. It's only four hours a week. The rest of it is wow. busy time to keep people occupied. Otherwise, they, they might start reading. You know, they might start talking oh. with, their, with their friends. And they, they might recognize that, gee, we, we still have the power of voting. We have the power of striking. You think we could, I don't know, get medical care? You think it's possible? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Um, all, right. all right. So Here's next, the next one. Here's the next one. This is a, uh, this is another, uh, this is one of my videos. This is very exciting for me. You'll see why, here it is. Agriculture was invented at least once again, much later in America. But the plow and the wheel were not because they depend on the draft animal. The step beyond simple agriculture in the Middle East was the domestication of draft animals. The wheel is found for the first time before 3000 BC, and from then on, the wheel and the axle become the taproot from which invention grows. For example, it's turned into an instrument for grinding wheat and using the forces of nature to do that. The animal forces first, and later the forces of wind and water. Well, now the cat's out of the bag. That's the explosion. The reason that the that homo homo exploded was because plowing permitted the invention of the wheel and the wheel it was simultaneously the invention of the axle and with the invention of the axle you have everything else bread windmills water wheels everything mm -hmm. even, even god god was a wheel spinner remember for, for aristotle you you had Earth and then moon layer and then what, what was the order? Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then you had the sphere of six stars. And outside of that was Yahweh. Yahweh was spinning the wheel, and the wind from the motion of the spinning star wheel made the Saturn wheel spin, and that kind of rubbed off on the Jupiter wheel all the way down to us and to the moon spinning around. So. You know, once once the wheel was made, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have motion and power and force carrying, and at the same time you have you have stability. So you could have something that's like a sable machine that that you know, yields lots of force, like a motor. Yeah. yeah. And so once we start envisioning the world like that, obviously there's all of these types of innovations and thinking and 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 technology that start to emerge out of that, right? Yeah, and. And also uh, metaphysics, and this is this is the philosophical mm -hmm. part of the series, is that uh, Bruno will look at how uh, our interaction with nature will lead to discoveries about the laws of nature, and then we'll think that maybe this is the basic thing. Remember, Thales, if you if you cut mm -hmm. a tree, you find sap. If you cut an animal, you find blood. If you dig mm -hmm. deep enough in the ground, you find water. So it's not a bad inference. This is the this is the break from mythology to philosophy, supposedly the break from from philosophy to, from mythology to science was not saying that gods were capriciously making things happen, but actually nature's doing it and nature's a machine and doesn't have any choice. So um, so this, so th there's a metaphysics that appears every time you have a new model of nature. And so uh, with the invention of the wheel, you have God, eventually God will become a geometer and a clockmaker. 
Mm, mm -hmm. And, and we will be machines of, of the clock type. And, and, and in the 17th century, we were actually making robots that could p play the piano and write. You'll see that in a later episode. Mm, mm. Okay. So, Scott, I want to get you to speculate on something because, I mean, you know I'm a, a, a climate change guy, right? So... Would would this would this in your mind would it would it count as a a new uh, you know pivot point paradigm shift whatever you know whatever you want to label it, but if we if if humanity switched into a um, uh, a compatible position with the environment, in, in, engage with the environment in a um, uh, uh, you know to optimize biodiversity. Do you, do you think that that would be something that would would count as a uh, a paradigm shift? If uh, could you say it differently? I mean, if if we switch from from oil energy to something else? Well, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, in the climate change conversation, right? There's there's a tremendous amount of um, effort directed at trying to keep. Um, uh, to, to, more, to move to more of a sustainable type of uh, civilization, right? And for me, when I look at the, the models that we have, the economic models that are uh, focused around gross domestic product, um, it's, 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 it's antithetical with the compatibility of the environment, right? So the, the emergent phenomenon that has to actually take place is a, a compatibility with nature, Right. And so when I'm looking at this video and I see that that humanity jumped or leaped into this into this um, this this, I guess, adaptation. Right. With um, with the environment. Right. To control it. Right. Um, do you think that we're on like the the the, the event horizon of, of something that's um, just as similar or just as significant if on the other side it is actually a a uh, like a biodiverse capa cap or, um, compatibility, I don't know. <clears throat> Alexander Cockburn wrote an article about this, where he 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 said every time that something is pushed by capital as being a, an innovation that's going to help in some way, it does end up ends up being just another ordinary industry. So I, I wonder if if we switch from oil to something that had less of a, of a carbon output, would things really change? Or would you still have shareholders calling the shots? And and I mean, would it really improve the environment that much? I mean, I suppose if everyone, I guess if, if if there was a complete change, if everyone took acid on the whole planet, I mean, it, it'd be possible. But it seems to me that it would end up becoming like a British Petroleum commercial theme or something like that. Like, hey, our carbon footprint has gone down, and we we expect that in the future, it's only going to be a million people a, a month dying from flooding instead of a billion, which is what it would have been without us. And then some music, and then fade out. I, I don't yeah. know, but maybe I'm a little cynical about that. No, you know what? Point well taken. Actually, it 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 really does feel that that's the trajectory that we're on. Um, so, you know, point point very well taken. And there's another uh, part about this this section of the video, which I know all the viewers have watched. Uh, this idea of using powers of uh, using animal power. We understand that because the animal's pushing his body. So when we see when we see the cow or the the donkey or the ox pulling, we can we imagine what it's like is we, we've also pulled and, and pushed things. Um, and but then later on, we're going to start coming up with a more and more abstract notion of power. So uh, animal power and but then wind and then we see wind pushing uh, veins and then we see a wheel turning and things are grinding. We realize, wow, wind is also power. It's that muscle stuff. I, that's isn't that weird. And then water, water pushing the veins uh, of the water wheel, and then causing an axle uh, to rotate. And then all sorts of stuff can happen from that. Oh my God, uh, water also. So then eventually, there'll there'll be this romantic movement in uh, European history, and it'll be just like things were before the agricultural time. It, it seems, except it's like we're self consciously identifying with power now. So even though maybe the Native Americans were one with their environment and they were in a perfect symbiosis, I bet they lack the type of self-consciousness and self-understanding that someone during the Romantic re Revolution had after the Industrial Revolution kicked in, and we and we saw that there was this there was this um, generic energy stuff inside of nature, 
and that we realize that maybe consciousness itself was this stuff. Uh, anyway, so, so the inkling of that is here. Imagine the day that someone hit upon the idea that human power, animal power, wind power, and water power were all power. Because you know that before that, they didn't have these abstract concepts. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. All right. Okay, so here's, uh, let's see, the next video. This is uh, another one of mine. This is about what agriculture does to social relations. Here we go. And they imply the existence by then of laws to govern water rights and land tenure and other social relations. In an agricultural community, the rule of law has a different character from the nomad law that governs the theft of a goat or a sheep. Now the social structure is bound up with the regulation of matters that affect the community as a whole. Access to land, the upkeep and control of waterways, the right to use, turn and turn about the precious constructions on which the harvest of the seasons depends. So that's nice. When you're locked up in the house with people, uh, things change. They can get tense, like in The Shining. That's kind of a miniature version, I think, maybe. You know, so before you'd roam around, and if you didn't like some guy, you would just avoid him all the time. But now all these primates are pulling, pushing, building, plowing, cleaning, maybe in, in close quarters, and there's lots of them. And then you have to have foremen that direct them, and then you have to have foremen for the foreman. And later he'll talk about how these hierarchies come up, these social hierarchies come up. So, wow, the agricultural revolution brought out things it brought out constraints on the human reaction to density so social density hmm. well and communal activity right so this is this is kind of the idea everybody has to kind of chip in and i i actually find it really interesting that i mean so much of the uh underlying structures are still so much with us or they're they're with us today so for example someone made the point to me one time about um summer breaks Right. I mean, if 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 you're a, a farmer and you're trying to, uh, I guess, just, you know, I guess you have to do your your fall harvest and all this type of thing. You know, you, you're are actually in the summer. You actually need your kids. You need them on the fields. You need them working. Right. And so this was this was the idea about the uh, about the summer break. Right. It's still with us today. It's not like, you know, my kids like what do we need a summer break for? Right. Is there any particular reason why we need, you know, two months off? I don't know. Like, it's a good question. It kind of gets you flat footed and you think to yourself, well, I don't know. Why is that? Why do we need a summer break? Yep. Still taught into that sort of circle of the of, of the agricultural sort of, uh, you know, cycle. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, in this next clip, let's see. This was for me the poetic climax of this episode. This is just so beautiful and the music is so great. This is one of the tear jerkers. So everyone have your Kleenex ready. Uh, <laughs> this is about the point we just made a second ago about discovery of generic energy and um, and then the warning about what happens. Today the warning is what happens when Google becomes self-conscious. But uh, actually there was a, there was a, a Google monster uh, thousands of years ago. It was the horse that's coming up after this section. But here, here's the section leading up to it. And now the village artisan has become an inventor in his own right. He combines the basic mechanical principles in sophisticated tools which are, in effect, early machines. This is a lathe which is turned by moving a bow to and fro so that the string rotates the drum that holds a piece of wood which is scored by a chisel. combination is several thousand years old but I saw it used by gypsies making chair legs in a wood in England in 1945. A machine is a device for tapping the power in nature. That's true of the simplest spindle that the bacteria women carry all the way to the historic first nuclear reactor and all its busy progeny. How is 
realize it, that the machine in its modern form now seems to us a threat. It begins when man first harnessed a power greater than his own, the power of animals. Every machine is a kind of draft animal, even the nuclear reactor. It increases the surplus that man has won from nature since the beginning of agriculture. Agriculture was one part of the biological revolution, and the domestication and harnessing of village animals was the other. So those are the two great prongs were raising aphids and sucking their sap. And at the same time, we're harnessing the aphids to wheels and making them do stuff. And so, wow, uh, nature is a battery and also a food supply. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I wanted to maybe make a point that, um, you know, technology in general, right? Um, I think goes all the way back to the, the the stories of Prometheus, you know, like the handoff of, of fire. And I think from that point forward, this is the idea that, um, you know, man is, 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 is enslaved, so to speak, with, with technology. Uh, maybe that's why Zeus was so upset at, uh, at Prometheus. I don't know. Good point. Well, actually, uh, something to add on that is that the this is where I, I have a bit of a, a difficulty trying to uncouple uh, man from technology. Uh, so, in the in the same way we were talking earlier about the um, the the idea that uh, you know certain animals are now uh, and plant species, so the wheat the wheat now is, is domesticated, so it can never get back to a, a wild state. Um, I, I, I think about this, about humans too. Like, I just don't know if it's, if it's within our capability to get back to a wild nomadic sort of state, you know, even, even if we wanted to, or were forced to do so, I don't know if it's possible. Yes. Well, uh, um, Actually, uh, later on, he, he, he hangs out with the nomadic uh, group, the, uh, mm. or, or maybe that was the previous video, uh, uh, the lapse. So I, I suppose it's possible, I don't know how fulfilling it would be, because they always need to go to town in order to get buttons and, uh, and kettles and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so what's, uh, what's the next one? Here's the, here's, uh, this is Dan's video on horses. Here we go. horse had begun by drawing wheeled carts, like the ox, but rather grander, drawing chariots in the processions of kings. And then, somewhere around 2000 BC, man discovered how to ride it. They were men out of Central Asia, Persia, Afghanistan, and beyond. In the West, they were simply called Scythians, a terror that swept over the countries that did not know the technique of riding. The Greeks, when they saw the Scythian riders, believed the horse and the rider to be one. That's how they invented the legend of the centaur. We cannot hope to recapture today the terror that the mounted horse struck into the Middle East and Eastern Europe when it first appeared. That's because there is a difference of scale which I can only compare with the arrival of tanks in Poland in 1939, sweeping all before them. In a sense, warfare was created by the horse as a nomad activity. That's what Huns brought, that's what the Phrygians brought, that's what finally the Mongols brought and brought to a climax under Genghis Khan much later. Yep, and then we get to see them play uh, polo with a, a sheep carcass. 
Yeah, yeah. I had to draw the line somewhere. I thought, you know what? But <laughs> war games, this is kind of the idea. And and it's gonna we're gonna talk about war games in the next clip as well. But the idea here and and you know why I picked that is because I do. I think that would be absolutely horrific if I was living in a village and I saw something like that rider on a uh uh, on a horse barreling at me, like my goodness, that yeah, like there's nowhere to go. If you saw a centaur, you would be concerned. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, and I and I think that you know we see it in movies. We get we get all of these these um, you know these ideas. We've been desensitized, but you, you you throw yourself back and you say we've got none of that other context. You know what what I have is my village. You know we've got a very simplistic kind of life, and then oh, we're going to be invaded by this like superhuman kind of like you know this like I don't know this like super being that can you know wreak havoc on havoc on our village, and you know I don't know. It's just it would be horrific, and I, I think uh, you know Jacob Bronowski you know, he equivocates this in Poland to the, to the tanks. Right. And, you know, how horrific that would be to see, you know, that steamroller coming across the country and destroying your, your life, you know, and your, your culture. Right. So, yeah. So this is the, one of the other great benefits of agriculture is the invention of war and organized theft and murder. So before you had uh, agriculture, you did have these zones of massive surplus. And now you have a zone of surplus, so you can have people that don't do any work, but just wait for other people to accumulate surplus through their careful milking and planting and plowing and tending. And then just in one day, you can come in and kill them and take their stuff. So that, that produces a new type of human being and a new ethical system. And uh, I mean, there's still people like that today. There's a, there's, there are classes all over the planet, classes of people who, who don't do any work, but just extract value from other people that do work and also manage the police forces to make sure that they continue to work. And in the movie, They Live, I think this is made very simple. They Live is a great educational film for children. It should be mandatory viewing for everyone because you get to see the capitalists or aliens. You put the sunglasses on and you see these monstrous people. They all have Rolexes on. That's how you know that they're the capitalists. <laughs> anyway, so, so with the invention of surplus, you get the invention of the parasite class of a uh, of um, marauding uh, warrior class. And then aren't they interesting? Aren't most of our favorite uh, uh, stories and uh, like heavy metal bands and movies? I mean, we, we love this image of the manly man with a, his helmet usually has spikes all over it. And he has, you know, kind of the Gene Simmons shoulder pads and he has a mace. Usually he's very attractive. You know, I, I also have a soft spot for this swords and sorcery uh, a genre and wouldn't you rather be an interesting murderer on a horse with a mace than some loser that was taking care of the animals and making sure every everyone was fed yeah well isn't it i mean in terms of of, of genghis khan's uh dna haven't you heard that there's uh uh i don't know like there's there's some of genghis genghis khan's uh, dna in all of us right you know and i don't know if that i i really can't say if that translates into any kind of um, masochistic types of underlying, uh, you know, epigenetic uh, tendencies at all. But I mean, I think it percolates out in popular culture. Uh, Shaka is the um, uh, old Mongolian word for father, and Shaka Khan is mm. a recording artist, and she's re recognizing the fact that he's her he's her father. Yeah, yeah, pretty perverse, I guess. It's you know uh, that's a strike against the the ideal good isn't it and that that platonic ideal that i talk about all the time you know that it, <laughs> you know is it is it ideal that we you know rape and, and and massacre you know people and take advantage and you know riot and loot it or, or, or you well, know isn't it rational and, doesn't that? it fall on, it's rational self interest uh, doesn't it qualify as rational self interest who's the rational monkey the one who toils and it was a caretaking you know, decent person in the team or the one who just relaxes and has sex and just eats all day long. And then without a food, he just kills people and takes their stuff and goes back home again. He's expended less effort and less energy. Isn't that more efficient? Isn't he the smart animal? Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, uh, evolution and selection, um, uh, reward him with, with more children. And, uh, he's got a better life, more happiness, as long as he has no moral, moral conscience or, or empathy. If he doesn't have any empathy, then what's the problem? Yeah, that's right. So maybe that's in 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 his world. That is the that is the highest ideal of good, right? 
Yeah, for many yeah. people, most people that, that play video games and, and D and D games, they 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 don't want to be. How come no D and D players are are the farmers that stay in the town? They're always the ones that get dressed up and and go do stuff, kill people, and take money. Is it? I think it's, it may it's just maybe it's just more interesting. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's our DNA telling us: be the warrior, don't be the loser farmer. Yeah. No. Maybe we're gonna uh, have to all be farmers one day. Who knows? That's right. I don't mind being a farmer, but you know, other people they they were more ambitious. All right, this is last this is the last clip. This is Dan's clip. This is War Machine is theft. Here we go. Genghis Khan was a nomad and the inventor of a powerful war machine. And that conjunction says something important about the origins of war in human history. Of course, it's tempting to close one's eyes to history and instead to speculate about the roots of war in some possible animal instinct, as if like the tiger, we still had to kill to live, or like the Robin Redbreast, to defend a nesting territory. But war, organized war, is not a human instinct. It is a highly planned and cooperative form of theft. And that form of theft began 10,000 years ago, when the harvesters of wheat accumulated a surplus and the nomads rose out of the desert to rob them of what they themselves could not provide. The evidence for that we saw in the walled city of Jericho and its prehistoric tower. That is the beginning of war. There we go. It, it, it partially answers the question or elaborates on the point of, uh, you know, that that's a that's a value system here, I, I would say. Um, and 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 a foundational ethical claim as a society. Do we want to um, live in a society that, uh, you know, promotes theft? I think it's uh, it, it's very apparent that we don't want to do that. Right, and so collectively, we've got a uh, a society that says that's 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 not acceptable. Um, yeah, that's right. Certain types of theft are illegal, but if it's if it's well organized theft, you know, of the large scale kind or the systematic kind, well, hey, that's just Chinatown, Jake. That's just the way America is. Also, Americans love a good con artist. I mean, mm. that's that's what. Besides promising to hurt uh, dark skinned people and and, and non English speakers. One of the reasons that people like Trump is that he was, a, he was a con artist and it's fun to see him operate. I think we talked about this last time. But uh, look, even look at Bilbo Baggins. What was Bilbo Baggins' class? He was a thief. He was a thief. And, and it's, it's done in the Dragons class. He, he was a thief. So, uh, yes, we, uh, we all say that theft is wrong, but our society uh, d does a lot of uh, educating to make us think that a certain kind of, of large-scale theft is natural, normal, and there has to be someone on top of the pyramid. I mean, we can't, we can't have cooperation. That's all. That's utopian pie in the sky. There has to be someone kicking ass on top. So it's better these guys that are at least, I mean, they dress nice when, when they do it to you than these other guys that, that look like, you know, they don't dress very well. So so theft has become uh, normal. I mean, it's not called theft. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe it's more interesting because Bilbo Baggins is a thief. It, it's not a story about... Um, 
about Farmer uh, Maggot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It could have been. It could have been the days, the days and nights of Farmer Maggot. That could have been the uh, the uh, the title of what became Lord of the Rings. And then you would have see the, you'd see uh, uh, Frodo and friends running through his field, and that would be the only thing you'd ever hear about them. It'd be like this pesky kids. That'd be the whole. That'd be the whole <laughs> in intersection with what for us are the heroes, which are the interesting ones that go go away on horse, and then uh, take stuff. Yeah, even the romanticized uh, Robin Hood. I mean, you know, he, he rose to the occasion to to become a thief, but uh, a hero to steal from. It depends who you steal from, apparently, right? So, well, if you steal from the stealers and give it back to the people, that's 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 like anti theft. I guess you could call that theft too, but I don't know. If someone <laughs> takes your stuff and I and I sneak into his house and I bring it back to you, am I am I really stealing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This, these are interesting things. But I think that was a very powerful statement. And I think when you when you could hear uh, Bernowski talk about and use the word theft, I could hear a strong emphasis in his voice. He was, this is, this is nothing else other than theft. Like, this is not what, you know, this is not what society should be uh, about, right? And so I don't think he endorses that in any in any capacity, right? In any kind of capacity. So on a large scale, it's war. On a small scale, theft is theft. So um, I think I think this is a, a, a foundational sort of social contract that the, the, that the people in power, whether it's a, a distributed or decentralized sort of power thing, it's something that we we have to agree to not not partake in, right? So I think that's you know, that's the takeaway for me, at least, on that one. Yep. All right, well, uh, shall we uh, mosey over to the uh, discussion area? Now, all the people that are waiting in the YouTube zone can meet us in the discussion zone. How do we get there? Well, we get there with uh, the link is in the description. So it's, the it's a, you know, right down there. You just have to make sure you click on the link and go over to the... Um, uh, it's, it's like a Google meet, uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll see you there and we'll, we'll carry on the conversation from here. All right. Okay. See you in a minute. Thanks.